which I hope everybody knows about Shell. So in 1984, this company Shell looked at a particular scenario, how they would react in future. The scenario they were looking at was that, what if the oil price falls down to $15 per barrel? Right? So this was like a very ridiculous scenario for many different counts. Like there were two particular reasons. One was by that time, the oil price was $28 per barrel and it was rising. Nobody expected that to fall down. Second thing was by common wisdom, the $15 per barrel is like end of the world for the oil company. So nobody would survive for $15 per barrel. So they had a lot of internal problems. Why the hell you are looking at a particular such in a uh, practical scenario, why shouldn't you be focusing on something you know, which is much more practical? But still they went ahead with this scenario and identified there are few more few things that they need to change in the particular company, the way they operate. So one was that they had to cut down the drilling of offshore oil offshoring. So of course, uh, any company would like to take the chance to cut down the cost and they, they went ahead of uh, developing those technologies. So by 1984, unexpectedly, the price of oil fall down, not to $15, but to $10. So that was like a huge slump uh, in oil prices. So what Shell plan earlier, two, weeks, uh, two years back, helped them to survive that particular rock bottom oil prices than, than their competitors. So for me, this is what I call a learning organization. So by definition, a learning organization is something that they try to create their own future. They, d they don't want to depend on any external factors. Let it be the market condition. Let it be the competitors around that, what the others are doing. They try to create their own future. They are not that much dependent on other external factors compared to the other customers. So, uh, so by definition, a learning organization is one that try to seek their own future. So I think uh, you have seen this book from the, the opening uh, keynote, so I'm not going to describe that, but one interesting fact, and this Professor Peter Senge is from MIT Sloan School of Management, and but Harvard Business Review recognized this book as one of the leading or the influential management book of last 75 years. It's a little interesting to see, you know, Harvard being recognized, or MIT being recognized by a Harvard uh, uh, Business Review. But anyway, so this book, like other interesting thing is, like other bigger factor is that this book is more, has more than one million prints in uh, publish. And uh, based on the success, uh, Peter Senge actually wrote down a few more series of uh, books. Uh, and if you uh, try to look at little bit into the learning organization. So there are five which he called components of uh, learning organization. Actually, he tried to say five disciplines of, uh, of a learning organization. In the sense, disciplines are the areas of practice. So uh, team learning, mental model, shared vision, personal mastery are uh, four components. And what is called system thinking is the foundation of the learning organization. So I, I'm not going into details about uh, these each and every, every component, but that's that's not uh, the my purpose of uh, being here. But I think I need to think a uh, talk a little about something called system thinking. Again, this is not something invented by Peter Senge. But this has been there from I think 1920s. There were many pioneers of uh, system thinkers, and there's a lot of communities around uh, system thinking communities. But what Peter Singh did was he used this system thinking uh, to uh, build a learning organization. So let me again uh, start with a story. Or let me try to explain system thinking uh, through a story. Uh, anybody from uh, New York? OK, good. So if, if you hear New York, I haven't been, unluckily. I mean, it's a, a big, nice city to be live in, right? It's like you know, the showcase of uh, USA. But if you go back to 1960s, 1970s, and to 1980s, this was not the, the city as it today. So this is not what I'm saying. If you s search Google, you will find a nice 
I don't know if it's nice, but an article from the New York Times. It says, the New York Public Library is an open-air drug market. And uh, Port Authority Bus Terminal, which I am thought to be the central place where interstate buses are being connected, like the big you know, central bus station, is full of beggars, drug addicts, and you know, every, every vandalism, every, every negative thing was there. And I mean, New York authorities were trying to you know, cut down this and you know, improve the city, not that they were not doing anything. So they were trying so many different things and increase the police force, they increase the penalties, even I, I'm not sure, but I think they increase even, they, they got the death penalty also in. So they were trying so many different things. But nothing was working for decades. Like it didn't work on 1960s, it didn't work on 1970s, it didn't work on 1980s either. But by 1990, the crime rates are falling down very sharply. Uh, in 1990s, in America, the, the crime rate were falling down like 28% per year, but in New York City it was falling like 56%. That was a more than a double of the global average, or, or sorry, US average. So what I'm trying to tell you and how I'm trying to connect it to the system thinking is about how they did that. So they did two things separate, uh, two things differently and specifically. One thing was, they had a zero tolerance policy for low crime rates, uh, sorry, uh, small crimes. And they lit up the city very bright and painted the walls and everything on bright colors. So if you consider the first thing they did, so for small crimes like you know, uh, vandalism, fee evasion, public urination, you know, they had a zero tolerance policy. If you do a small thing, the police comes and capture you and put you in the jail, give the, you the, the severest punishment they could have been doing. So this was criticized to the bone, because they were criticized that, why are you focusing on these small things, whereas you know, big, criminal, big criminals are out there in the, in the open. But this is what contribute to, uh, to the low crime rate, and this is what contribute to uh, the city as today. So in criminal science, actually now this is called broken window theory, if you read the, the, the Google and uh, uh, Wikipedia. So this is a prime example of system thinking. So system thinking, there's uh, some concept called uh, point of high leverage. So the point of high leverage is that the small ac smallest action where you can you know, make a big difference. So you, you need to think around the system. So that's what the New York City Council did. Instead of uh, focusing on the big crimes, they were focusing on the small crimes. Instead of you know, uh, making people not come into the street, they lit up the street, they painted the street in a good, nice bright colors, so they, they made the people come into the, the cities or the streets. So that was what helped to uh, fall down the crime rate. So, if I just stop talking about the learning organization and uh, the system thinking, so these I have taken these from uh, Agile Manifesto. I just try to put down some of the, the principles uh, from the Agile Manifesto. So if you if you focus on the the bold uh, word, like motivated individuals, self-learning teams, focus on technical excellence, and uh, you know working together, the business people and Right? These are the key ingredients for a success of uh, Agile, right? I mean, we need to have everybody motivated. We need to have self-organizing teams. And you know, quality is not something that you can uh, compromise in Agile. But in reality, do you really find that? Unfortunately, maybe I'm unlucky, but I am not. So do you find like everybody self-motivated, everybody motivated? Do you find the teams being self-organizing? And do you think like, you know, the people will look at to the technical excellence every day? And do you find even the business people come? You will be more successful in your life. So this can be taken for our personal life as well. So Alex has written that book based on this. And there's uh, another one, uh, another like a leading researcher called Sean Aker. I think if you have heard uh, his TED Talk, it's fantastic TED Talk. He has two books. 
uh, Happiness Advantages and Before Happiness, which came last year, I think. So these are like fantastic books. So we try to do a lot of uh, things at Exilesoft, small things. You don't need to, you know, bring uh, money into the picture. Money is totally out of uh, this uh, focus. So we do small things. We try to appreciate people. We try to celebrate together. We try to do something called Random Acts of Happiness. Actually, you re read that book. It comes from there. And he has a nice uh, video of about that. Because only un the stressed brain doesn't learn as unstressed brain. So we try to do a lot of things to uh, make uh, employees happy at textiles of doing small, small things. Appreciation is one of the biggest things. And uh, rest of the slide, rest of uh, five minutes which I have, I'll try to talk about igniting the personal mastery. But I need to make a, a word of caution. If you're trying to build a learning organization, you cannot build one by one. You have to build everything together. But I'm just trying to explain what we are trying to do at Textilesoft in terms of personal mastery, just because I don't have uh, enough time. But if you're trying to build something, if you're trying to learn something through learning organization, don't think that you can first uh, kick off the learn, uh, personal mastery and then go to something else, to mental model, et cetera. No, you need to build it together. So we have a total different performance review. So we have separated uh, something called professional growth to the monetary returns. We, we, the professional growth, it's something that runs continuously. And of course, your salary reviews or what we call it, something that uh, comes every year. And if you look at traditional performance review, no matter what it called, can be 360 degrees feedback, anything and everything. There's a manager in mall who's tried to set down certain things uh, for you. But what you're trying to do and what is based on personal mastery is that we try to get the employees to come up. And we have one simple, simple single rule. You can pick anything as far as it improves something. So this is the role we try to work. And we have got some examples like uh, people trying to wire their own cars to different uh, you know, LEDs and all these electronic gadgets. That's nothing to do with what his daytime job is. But we, tr we encourage these people because it improves certain things. That is because personal mastery, it has two components, if you read the, the book Learning Organization. One is that you need to accept your truth, accept your reality. You should not be afraid of your, uh, uh, the true situation. And other one is, you need to have something called personal vision. What is important is personal vision is not something that can be put top down. It can be, it should come from within yourself. So in our belief, where the traditional performance review gets wrong is that it's whatever you call it, the starting point is top. You sit down with the manager and have a discussion, okay, you need to improve these, 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 these things. So anyway, you're just trying to dance to the tune of that particular manager. So here, we don't have any influence as managers. We let people to come with what they want to do, but with this simple rule. So next thing, what we try to do is to build up certain knowledge communities around uh, exiles. So this is an example from uh, what we call it book, book club or the reading circle. So we, we encourage people at Exilesoft to read, not only read, but also to share the knowledge. So if I read a book, I would like to read, uh, share, it, share the knowledge with uh, the whoever around me and whoever interested. Of course, there are people who are not really interested of reading. That's fine. They, they, will, they have their own interest. But whoever interested, we try to you know, discuss over the water cooler or coffee, uh, coffee machine, or the, the tea, ma tea making uh, place. We try to di discuss certain things. And we use Confluence uh, as our corporate wiki, and we try to list down certain things. Okay, these are the books that I have read, and these are the recommendation, and you know, blah, blah. So these are very small and very easy step. This doesn't cost, cost anything. But what, what it creates is a culture. I think if you hear, were here for the previous session, 
I think Deepesh talked about you know the culture, changing the culture is one of the difficulties. So these are the, the small things that we try to, uh, to change the culture and to become and encourage something we call knowledge culture. And uh, other thing is like we try to be a little live and we, ha we try to create certain uh, Skype group. We, we talk about uh, you know, nice videos which I have uh, uh, watched over TED or YouTube or something and we try to share around individuals. So it's a voluntary thing, and we don't, we, we purposefully try to avoid spamming. You know, you're trying to work out, and all of a sudden, certain things uh, pop up in Skype. That's a disturbance for you. So, and there's a principle called economics of mean. That means the biggest impact would come from smallest activities. So it's something we also try to do that. We don't, we don't you know, we don't announce, okay, we're trying to change the culture now. Now, from tomorrow onwards, we'll, we'll be focusing on knowledge culture. That doesn't work. We try to do small, small things. Sometimes it might see that those are not connected, but all are focusing on one particular direction. So uh, I have some more material in terms of how to uh, connect the learning organization and agile organizations. If you're interested, you can read uh, this particular post. Uh, but I think my 20 minutes is over. Any questions or anything? Yeah. What are the total students in the Uh We are around 130 at Colombo. So Yeah, so this is more of towards the culture, culture change. So as everybody, <coughs> and everybody needs to contribute. So we try to encourage people, you know, read. Uh, why don't you, uh, we have something called technical talk or tech talk program. Why don't you, uh, you know, contribute to that? Why don't you have your own blog? Why don't you try to, you know, uh, share your knowledge among communities in Sri Lanka or worldwide? So through those small things, we try to you know, sail the organization towards uh, what we believe as a learning organization. So it's not something that we uh, apply for this particular team and next day apply for uh, this particular team. So this is an organization-wide thing, uh, at least we're trying to do it uh, in Colombo, still a little far from uh, you know, Norway and uh, Sweden and Australia for the moment. But this is like organization initiative at the uh, Colombo office. Okay, uh, thanks a lot.